Good evening. My name is Bruce Painter and I am the director of the Burlington Township Police Department. On behalf of the department's Social Justice Committee, I would like to welcome you to tonight's virtual town hall meeting titled, Know Your Rights. Based on the feedback we received from the previous town hall meeting, we identified four topics that we feel need to be discussed openly with our community. These topics center on police citizen encounters, use of force, complaints against officers, and citizens' rights during police encounters. The best way to address these topics was to form a panel of select individuals that have direct knowledge and hands-on experience in the identified areas. Their knowledge base includes the investigation of internal affairs complaints, the overseeing of use of force, criminal defense, and the protection of individual rights. The goal tonight is to provide insight and clarification on how Browning Township police officers engage the public and are not universal to other police departments. I hope you find tonight's forum informational and we look forward to answering your questions as best as possible. I would like to thank the panel for their participation, as well as you, our citizenry, for taking part. I now turn tonight's forum over to our moderator, Ms. Liz Scott. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our second town hall. We are so excited um, by the, the positive response that we are getting from our community and the participation uh, has been second to none. Burlington Township is a great place to live and it is wonderful that we have involved and engaged community members. Uh, before we get started, um, I am going to briefly introduce our panelists. Um, they will uh, give just a brief background about themselves, and then we're gonna dive into the critical conversations, which is the main reason why we are here tonight. So first, I would like to introduce Dorian Morgan, who is an attorney at law and also a Burlington Township resident. Dorian? Okay, thank you, Liz. Um, again, my name is Dorian Morgan. I'm an attorney uh, in, in now in Mount Holly. I just moved um, in March to Mount Holly. Um, born and raised Burlington Township, uh, 1988 grad from high school, uh, the best year uh, township has seen. Um, <laughs> Uh, I graduated from um, Trenton State College with a law and justice degree in 1993. Uh, then I went on to uh, Philadelphia Institute Paralegal uh, Studies, uh, where I got my, my paralegal certificate in 94. Uh, then I joined the Burlington County Prosecutor's Office as a prosecutor's agent from 95 to 98. Uh, during that time, I entered law school at Rutgers Camden, um, graduated there in 2001. Uh, and was a law clerk for Judge Tom Smith uh, in criminal division uh, for a year. Directly after that, I, I opened my own law practice in Burlington. So since 2002 uh, to now, I've been uh, practicing law, mostly in criminal and municipal court, uh, some smattering other areas, but this is my area of law. Thank you. Dorian, thank you so much. And I just think I need to make one tad bit of a correction. Uh, you meant to say class of 87 was the best <laughs> class to come out of Burlington Township, but that's okay. <laughs> Next, it is my pleasure to introduce um, Brian Falk, who is the assistant prosecutor from the Burlington County Prosecutor's Office. Brian, could you please introduce yourself? Thank you. Um, my name is Brian Falk. I, w I am currently a Burlington County prosecutor. I am the supervisor of the internal affairs and the uh, special investigations unit. Um, I took over who used to be with the job was Tad Drummond for many years. Um, he went on to retirement uh, about a year and a half ago and I've taken over for him. Prior to um, Coming to the Burlington County Prosecutor's Office, I actually worked at the Attorney General's Office for about four and a half years. Uh, I enjoyed my time in Trenton. I, when I was up there, I worked in the Corruption Unit, uh, which is now the OPIA unit. Uh, I also worked in financial crimes and computer crimes. Um, prior to that stint, I actually was in civil practice for a couple of years uh, and enjoyed my time. Uh, immensely in civil practice, uh, did not enjoy the billable hours portion of it, but I did enjoy my time in uh, civil practice. And actually, when I started my law career, uh, I've kind of come full circle. I clerked for a judge in Camden, and then I immediately came to the Burlington County Prosecutor's Office from 2004 to 2007. 
So I started here uh, as my career, uh, and now I'm back here for, and I can tell you, I'm back here for the rest of my career. Uh, I love Burlington County. I enjoy Burlington County, and I couldn't be happier to be uh, it, working for the prosecutor's office and also here tonight. Um, and hopefully I can answer any questions people have, and if they have any issues, please feel free to ask. And Brian, thank you so much. We really appreciate you being a part of this important conversation this evening. And finally, last but certainly not least, I would like to introduce Lieutenant James Sullivan from the Burlington Township Police Department. Uh, thank you, Liz. Thank you, Director. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, yeah, uh, Jim Sullivan, Burlington Township Police Department. I'm a lieutenant. I'm in charge of our administrative division. Uh, that includes overseeing our uh, accreditation efforts, uh, all of our policy uh, drafting and maintenance, uh, our training program, as well as internal affairs uh, and some other additional um, support services functions in the records bureau. And uh, last and certainly not least would be our community resource bureau as well. Um, I. Uh, been in that position for going on eight years now uh, and, and during my tenure I've, I've uh, had the opportunity to uh, be a president of the uh, Internal Affairs Association of Burlington County as well as uh, I've, I've had the, um, well, the sincere fortune of being able to travel across the country uh, to review and assess other departments and their, po uh, their policies and their practices and their procedures to see whether or not they um, comport with the best standards as determined by our accrediting body. So that's kind of the, the, uh, the experience I bring to the table tonight. Okay, thank you very much. So um, as Director Painter um, opened up, we are here tonight to have a very important conversation and discussion and to get questions from our community about um, knowing your rights when you are stopped or you have an interaction with law enforcement. Um, as all of you know, we've seen a lot of things happening over uh, the past few months. And um, I have to really give credit to our police department for their transparency, for their willingness to have these conversations and to be willing to engage with the community so that there is um, open dialogue and communication going back and forth. So we're gonna dive right in. Um, I have a few questions that um, we have here that we're going to ask. And I encourage um, all of our participants tonight to use the feature um, at the bottom of your screen to submit questions. We will try our best to get to as many of those questions as we possibly can. And um, some questions, we have folks helping us behind the scenes that are just basic questions will be answered, uh, maybe answered directly in the chat. So to get us started, um, Lieutenant Sullivan, I'm going to um, address you first. Can you tell us a little bit about the protocols that um, the BTPD officers, what they must follow when they conduct car stops um, or otherwise engage in any police citizen encounter? For instance, um, can an officer just stop anybody for any reason? Um, and what documentation must they complete when they do stop someone? Thank you, Liz. Um, and I, I think to begin, I'm gonna just quickly address a, a question I just saw in the chat. Someone was asking whether or not uh, the material we're gonna cover tonight is, is suitable or appropriate for, for young children. And um, we're, we're going to be talking about use of force. We're going to be talking about internal affairs. Um, so there, these are difficult uh, uh, topics of conversation, uh, but certainly we're going to be doing it in a, in a professional manner. Um, but, but they are, you know, the, and I think I'll, everyone would agree that we're, we'll leave it to you, as, you folks as parents as to what age you think your children should be uh, participating in these, but they, they are. They're sensitive, they're sensitive topics uh, by their very nature. So um, I hope that answers the question. Um, so, uh, when we talk about protocols for officers and, um, and, uh, I think it's good to preface that, you know, we're speaking on behalf of the Burlington Township Police Department. Um, you know, every, every, uh, law enforcement agency, though, there are certainly, uh, standards, um, throughout the state and standards throughout the nation that each agency kind of has its own, 
uh, policies and procedures and, and protocols as long as they still adhere to those uh, those base standards as established on a statewide or nationwide level. So if we think about um, car stops or, or investigatory stops or pedestrian stops as we refer to them, like I, I think if, if I kind of break down the answer into three sections, um, uh, the first being when can an officer stop somebody? When are they authorized to do it? The second one being um, what can they do while during the stop? Um, and then kind of like the third part would be what are some administrative oversight or protocols that the police department has in place um, when, when stops do occur? So I think first and foremost, it's, it's important to note that in order for a, a police officer to initiate any type of uh, car stop, motor vehicle stop, pedestrian stop, some sort of investigative detention, that there's a legal threshold that needs to be satisfied. And that legal threshold is what's called reasonable articulable suspicion. And that is the officer has to be able to uh, uh, identify a particular reason why he or she believes that there's been some type of violation that's occurred, is occurring, or is getting ready to occur. Um, that could be a traffic offense, that could be an ordinance violation, that could be some other type of criminal activity, whether it be, you know, a burglary in progress, uh, or, 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 or maybe um, there's what we call a, a bolo, be on the lookout that uh, such and such description car with such and such description folks were maybe involved in a, a, a crime the town next door and lo and behold, here, here a car and, and, and uh, uh, individuals matching that description come by, the officer would have reasonable suspicion to stop that vehicle. Uh, so again, it's not, you know, officers don't, there, there is that threshold, there's that, there is that, um, that, that uh, constitutional threshold that they have to be able to identify some particular suspicion as to there being a violation there. Um, once we get into the stop, if, we think about uh, it from a motor vehicle perspective, officers are authorized to ask the driver for a driver's license, registration card, and insurance card. Um, they are to provide these documents or are, are, are ticketable offenses. Um, those are violations if they don't. And what I would also say is outright refusal to provide these documents or an outright refusal to comply with a, uh, an officer's orders might then trigger uh, the officer to, to, to dig deeper, they're authorized to dig deeper, and maybe in, in, if, the, uh, if the right circumstances apply, they could even put that person under arrest. Um, additionally, you know, we think about um, if, if it's a car and there's, you know, maybe four people in the car. Well, if the officer has reason to believe that the passengers maybe have violated something, they're authorized to, to try to identify those passengers as well. Um, if we also think about uh, searches, and you know, I, I understand that that's, that's would be a concern is that um, in order for a stop to escalate to a search, um, and, and let me take a step back for a, a moment, sticking with the reasonable articulable suspicion standard, that if, um, if an officer believes somebody might be presently armed and dangerous, then the officer could frisk that person for the weapon. Um, but to get to a full-blown search, whether it be of the car or of the person itself, the level of, of suspicion that the officer needs to satisfy then elevates to a probable cause standard, which requires a little bit more justification. So again, if the officer believes that somebody has in their possession some type of contraband, or there's some type of evidence of crime, or maybe there's even proceeds of the crime, the stolen jewelry or, or something along those lines, uh, then they can search the vehicle or the person. Um, so again, it's not, you know, it's not, the officers are trained and, and we through supervision and policy reinforce the fact that there are all these legal thresholds that need to be met. Um, you know, they can't just kind of go out there and cowboy it up and stop anybody and everybody uh, that, that there are those, those constitutional protections. And then the last uh, point I'll address real quickly is if we think about the, like the, uh, how, do, how, how do we as a department, like what kind of administrative oversight or what kind of supervisory oversight do we have over our folks? Um, uh, when they're, they're doing car stops. So uh, first and foremost, every car stop that our officers conduct, they, they've got to call it out on radio. Um, so it goes out on radio. This is both for an officer safety perspective and it's also for, for documentation so that our dispatchers can document that the car stop has occurred. Um, 
In Burlington Township, all of our marked patrol vehicles are equipped with uh, patrol cameras uh, in the cars themselves. And additionally, all of our officers are equipped with body cameras. So again, policy mandates that in the course of making these stops, that they have to activate those cameras to document the stops. Um, additionally, whenever an officer does uh, uh, conduct what we call officer initiated activity, when the officer is the one who chooses to make the stop, um, that they have to also document on a stop log the fact that that stop has occurred. And that stop log uh, captures certain information like the vehicle description, the license plate number, uh, the reason for the stop, time, location, date, um, uh, certain demographic information about the, the occupants of the vehicle, um, whether or not there was a search of the car or of the person. And again, this, this stop log is meant as an, as a, as an administrative measure that's mandated actually throughout the entirety of Burlington County. I can't speak for the rest of the state, but throughout the entirety of Burlington County that we document on these stop logs the fact that this activity has, has occurred. Um, so that we have, you know, if, uh, and, and we as in the department, we review that information to make sure that they're, uh, to see if we can identify if any officer misconduct is occurring there. Um, and then last but not least, just speaking for Burlington Township, we as an agency, you know, um, we, our, our, our policy, uh, compels our officers to identify themselves and also uh, to, to tell the person the reason for the stop. Um, ideally, conditions permitting, that's going to that's gonna occur at the door. That's going to that's gonna occur right at the initiation of the stop. But I think, uh, you know, I think we can recognize that at times maybe that's not entirely safe um, for maybe for some investigative reasons. Maybe we're not going to get to that until later on, um, or maybe the situation is too rapidly evolving that we can't get to that so the officer has to do what he or she needs to do to settle things, stabilize the situation, make sure everything's okay. But at some point during this process, you know, the officer is gonna be identified and, and what, why the stop has occurred is going to be identified. Um, so I, I, I hope I addressed all your points, Liz. I think I did. You did. Um, I just wanna ask you just to, to delve a little bit deeper in terms of, um, we have a lot of parents who are um, watching this and probably some of them are, are watching with their um, drivers. Um, I know for me personally, uh, with, with my children, you know, we tell them if you're ever stopped by a police officer, make sure your hands are at 10 and two and you make sure you follow all of the directives that you're given. Um, what would you say to, um, to our parents in terms of them advising their children when they are stopped, what should they and should not do? So um, I think I, the lights go on, right? The, the, the officer's vehicle lights go on, red lights, blue lights flashing. Um, it's certainly, and this is something that our officers take into consideration as well, that we wanna stop people in the safest place that we can considering the, the, you know, the, the circumstances. We don't wanna stop somebody on two, 295 with cars whizzing by at 100 miles per hour if we don't have to. Um, but so, the officer is going to should you know so that the, the, the folks should should as 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 reasonably safely as they can pull over. Um, and we also uh, we very much appreciate if, if folks turn especially if it's at nighttime turn the interior lights on. Certainly, officers are concerned about uh, not only just the safety of themselves but also the safety of the folks that they're dealing with. So the more we can see, if you will, that, that make sure that everything's safe. That's 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 better for everybody involved. Um, I, I don't, you know, I don't know maybe if, if Dorian wants to tackle maybe a piece of this from the, you know, what, what should folks do, but, you know, we just, our officers, you know, if, if they're giving instructions, if, if they're giving uh, uh, orders, if they're giving commands that, uh, you know, um, people complying with those, I think creates the greatest likelihood of bad consequences not happening, right, and, and, and unintended bad outcomes from occurring. So, um, you know, pull over as quickly as you can, turn the lights on, you know, there's these documents that we're going to request, please provide them, keep your hands where we can see them. You know, a lot of times we do get people who maybe they are nervous and inadvertently they're, they're fidgeting around and, or maybe, you know, maybe, and it's just as a matter of habit, I keep putting my hands in my pockets, you know, our, our officers are trained that hands are, 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 are the things that could harm them. So we want to see hands. So th those are the things that we would appreciate if, if, if um, when the officer asked for that, if, if uh, you know, folks would comply with that. Okay, and, and Dorian, um, following up on that question, 
Um, I would like for you to, um, you know, any other additional information you have in response to that answer, but also delving into the actual rights that people have um, when they're stopped by the police. Um, and probably more importantly, what responsibilities do, do we have as private citizens when we're stopped by the police? Um, yeah, so uh, in this situation, uh, you mentioned specifically being stopped in, in a car stop. A car stop. So uh, first of all, I want people to know that there's a difference between being stopped in a vehicle and stopped on the street, um, because once you because um, you don't have a right to drive. Uh, driving in the state of New Jersey, and, and in fact every state, is a privilege. Uh, and in, uh, in 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 taking on that privilege, you've decided to give up some of your rights. Uh, one of your rights being uh, you have to identify yourself when the, when the police officer pulls you over. You must give them your driver's license, registration and insurance. Uh, I, I, thankfully, Lieutenant says that uh, their policy is uh, to uh, hopefully right up front tell you why you were pulled over, but that is not uh, a legal responsibility for the police officer, but you do have a legal responsibility to give them your driver's license, uh, registration, and insurance. So if they ask for it and they didn't yet tell you why, don't argue. Don't tell them I'm not giving you my information until you tell me why I'm stopped. You don't have the right to do that. Um, and, and, and as you start that kind of conversation, what happens is, as Lieutenant was saying, it knocks it up from just a normal stop to now a probable cause situation that can go into a detention, can go into arrest if, if, if necessary. Um, so give them your information. Listen, uh, you know, I, I, my thing is just listen to what they have to say. I don't. I can't imagine a, a police stopping you, going through the entire stop, and then leaving without telling you why they pulled you over. Um, if that happens, and you think there was some uh, malicious reason for it, you certainly have the right, and we'll talk about it. I'm sure later that you have a right to, to file a complaint. If you think it was some sort of harassing or something else, um, you have the right to uh, file a complaint. Um, but your responsibility as a driver in the state of New Jersey is to give those documents. Um, I can go into a whole bunch of different scenarios, but uh, at this point to keep it moving, I'll, I'll keep it short. Okay, so we actually have um, two things that just popped up in the chat. Can someone please touch on um, a citizen's use of a camera or recording devices during a stop? or witnessing um, some type of, of activity? Let, let me jump in and then Lieutenant, you can probably flesh it out even better. Uh, so in the state of New Jersey, you are allowed to record. Uh, as long as one person uh, knows that the recording is going on, you're allowed to record. However, um, remember the Lieutenant was talking about your hands. Um, you really wanna be careful uh, especially if you're in your car stop or something, you cannot interfere with the police officer. So uh, I've seen body-worn cams where someone actually held their phone up in the police officer's face saying, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm videoing you while the police officer's trying to get the information. Uh, you can't do that. That's interference. Um, but if you have a, v, you know, you can set it up where it can record and not get in the way. Um, I would suggest letting the officer know, listen, I, I'm recording this, uh, and then be as cooperative as possible. Uh, Lieutenant, if there's something else that you can add, I don't. Uh, I mean, I'll echo your comments. It's, it's our officers are, are, are trained, um, and, and they recognize that um, uh, the, the citizen right to be able to record what's occurring out there on the street is, is if someone, if, if a citizen can lawfully be there, they can lawfully record it, right? Um, and it, it, that that's certain that's something that we we recognize, and, and we are not going to uh, come barking at people, telling them to turn their phones off or or anything along those lines. So long as, like you identified, so long as them recording isn't somehow physically interfering with what the officer is doing. If if it is a very uh, kind of adversarial, antagonistic. The officer can't pay attention to what he or she needs to pay attention to because I now have to deal with you over here, 
that that could be problematic, especially if you're within close proximity, you know, and I, we have seen it many times uh, in, in my review of officer videos. I've seen it many times and folks do, they want to record what's happening. Our officer is very politely, please go stay on the sidewalk. You can record, but please go stand over there so that I, I you know, I don't have to worry about you uh, either interfering with this or who knows, you, you might not even know what's going on in the car. You might not even know the reason for the stop. There could be guns there. There could be something violent getting ready to happen. And we certainly don't want those per people to get um, injured either. But yeah, the use of those cameras are certainly permitted to do that. Um, and we're not going to interfere with that so long as it does not interfere with the officer being able to perform his or her duty. So let me ask you another question that has um, come up in the chat. Under what circumstances would a driver be required to um, exit the car? I, uh, I mean, I, I can tackle that and I, I don't, um, I can speak from the police perspective is that it's the, you know, the, uh, if you're talking about a motor vehicle stop and you're talking about a driver, the driver has the obligation to uh, provide driver's license and, 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 um, and, and, uh, be identified, uh, otherwise they're subject to some summonses and potentially arrest. And additionally, that um, the law legally, uh, officers are permitted to have operators step out of the vehicle at any time. It's a different standard for, for uh, uh, passengers, but for drivers, they're authorized to have them come out at any time. Passengers require a more, um, uh, a heightened uh, a heightened sense of, of, of alert there, that there's something about this passenger that makes me want to take the person out of the vehicle for officer safety reasons. But for the driver, it's, they can at, at any time. Okay. And, and from, just from the legal uh, or, or practical side, um, when should a person get out the car? Anytime a police officer tells you to get out the car, get, get out the car. It's, it's better for you to just, do what they're asking you. Um, and if there's an issue, we can address it later. Here's my, my, my mantra is always, the police officer is the authority on the street. Do not fight your battles, legal or physical. Don't fight with a police officer on the street. Uh, every police officer is under the authority, first of all, of, of his, of his uh, department, that, that you, can, you can address it at the department level. If you feel like you're not getting the, the proper redress, you can go up to the county uh, or, or you can go to the courts. There, there's so many places that you can um, uh, redress or, or, or address your, your issues with police officers. But if a police officer tells you, get out the car, just get out the car, get out the car, do what they're asking you to do. Um, because you don't know if this has gone from uh, uh, um, just a routine stop you don't know if it's going to uh, a probable cause detention. I can talk about those things in a little while. Probable cause detention, or if it's going to an arrest because uh, they found out that there's a warrant out for you. Um, and I've had situations where it was a, a false warrant or, or a warrant that had not been cleared out of the system. Uh, so it shouldn't have necessarily been there. Uh, however, the, the police officer is operating on the information that they have. And if they say, get out the car, you must get out that car. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. So the next question um, is directed at both Lieutenant Sullivan and Assistant Prosecutor Falk. If someone is displeased uh, with the way an officer has treated, um, treated them or believes that the officer did something inappropriate, what should that person do? Lieutenant Sullivan, can you address that first? Um, yeah, so, uh, the, 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 I guess the blanket response is if at any time anybody feels as though an officer to did something inappropriate is to make a complaint, um, you know, in the state of New Jersey and, um, our internal affairs process is driven by the state process. Um, and, and I, I think I'll let assistant prosecutor Falk maybe talk a little bit about that in a moment, but like in our agency, at 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, anybody can come in and make a complaint. We don't send people away. We don't say come back next Monday. We don't say you have to come back when so-and-so is here. Um, we'll accept the complaint. Juveniles, anonymous sources, uh, undocumented, undocumented immigrants, anybody, we take the complaint. 
Um, we as an agency, 24 hours a day, have uh, at least one supervisory uh, personnel on, on duty. So there's at least one sergeant on duty 24 hours a day. So we, those are the folks that we've tasked with taking complaints when they come in the door. But if for some reason that person is unavailable, any officer can take a complaint. So I can't, I can't stress enough that any, at, at any time, any day of the week, by anybody, if someone wants to make a complaint, you can make a complaint. Um, you know, um, it, it, if, it, if, if the person's complaint involves a, maybe a misunderstanding of what, of what is actually a, a law enforcement, uh, a lawful law enforcement practice, like Dorian was mentioning that, you know, the, you know, the, if the, someone comes and complains, the officer may be coming out of the car. Well, if the sergeant explains that to the person that that, that is lawful, that's permitted, and if the person is satisfied with that response, that can be, that can be handled at that level. But everything else, from demeanor complaints to bias-based policing complaints, excessive force, uh, some other type of rule violation, every single other complaint for the Burlington Township Police Department gets accepted and comes directly to me as, as, as uh, the one who does internal affairs. And uh, a couple of things happen procedurally. Number one, the person who makes the complaint is, is sent and is provided some basic information about how the internal affairs process occurs. Additionally, they get documentation that says, yes, we have your complaint. Your complaint has been assigned a number. So there's a tracking record there that yes, uh, you know, these things aren't just getting filed in the, uh, in the, in the shredder. Um, you know, the investigation occurs. Uh, if it's minor issues, if it's dis uh, demeanor issues or maybe a minor uh, rule violation, that investigation will go to the, uh, super, uh, excuse me, the officer supervisor to conduct uh, under the supervision of internal affairs. But if it's a major complaint, it stays with internal affairs. And the, again, the investigation will run its course. Uh, witness interviews, officer interviews, uh, collecting physical evidence if necessary, reviewing video, uh, securing video, talking to witnesses out, out on the scene that may have been there when, whenever the incident occurred. That's all part and parcel of the investigation. Um, at some point, the investigation will conclude. And then again, the complainant will be provided some more information and they, uh, they, uh, uh, they get informed of the outcome. Was the complaint sustained? Meaning, yes, did the officer violate something? Was the complaint unfounded? Meaning they, the incident never occurred. You know, you're making an allegation and our investigation determined that this thing never even happened. Mm -hmm. um, is it not sustained, which is, uh, there's, not an, there's not enough information one way or the other to say whether a violation did happen or, or did not happen. That's not sustained. And then the, the last option would be exonerated, which is, yes, this thing occurred, but what the officer did is appropriate and within policy. They were authorized to do that. So uh, the complainant will be notified of, of the outcome. Um, you know, if, if there's a violation there, our officers can be retrained they can be uh, uh, infor you know, informally counseled. They can be uh, uh, formally reprimanded. They could face fine suspension uh, up to including the, the level of, of termination if necessary. Um, I, I, I got to kind of come back and say everything I just discussed would occur if it was a complaint of an administrative violation. Mm -hmm. If it's a complaint of a criminal nature, that's when I call assistant prosecutor fault. And, and before you go to fault, just please let them know that all of this, unfortunately, is done confidentially. Did you mention that already? Because I know, I know a lot of people say, well, uh, I made my complaint, but I want to know what's happening to this officer. I want to know how did it, you know, what was the result? And I know in, in some of the matters I've seen, they have not felt satisfied with the answer because it was confidential as to how it was uh, handled. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's, um, you are correct, Dorian, there, there's, um, again, it's, it's, not, it's not the internal world of internal affairs according to the Burlington Township Police Department. In this regard, we are subordinate to the State Attorney General's Office, and the State Attorney, Attorney General's Office has very regimented guidelines as to how these investigations occur and what kind of information can be disclosed and not disclosed. So we're subject to that, but you're right that as a general matter, there's, um, there's not, there's not much information that goes back out other than the resolution of it. It was sustained. There was a violation, but uh, uh, more about like how many days was he suspended or what right. that, yeah. that, that you're right. That does not get disclosed. Although we are very much in a, 
a, a bit of a transitional period in internal affairs on the state level, right, uh, uh, Brian? I would totally agree with that statement. Um, and I just want to point out to uh, both Dorian and Jim, I'm, I'm, sorry, I'm sure you both know that uh, there is brand new guidelines that came out in December, I think it was December 4th of last year, um, attorney, new attorney general guidelines came out and then a new internal affairs uh, policy came out, which has now been implemented. It was uh, postponed for a period of time, but has now been implemented in, I believe it was August 31st or September 1st it started, where the, the attorney general has given us a new policy uh, or kind of codified it in a different way, I should say, and given us a policy that we all have to follow now. So everything kind of stems from the attorney general's office down and it goes to from the attorney general's office to the county prosecutor's office to the municipalities. Um, Lieutenant Sullivan uh, is correct in the exact process. If you have a complaint and you have a complaint with the township or you have a complaint with a prosecutor's uh, office um, employee or uh, a prosecutor's office law enforcement officer, or even somebody from a different town or a different county in New Jersey, um, we are required to accept those complaints. It does not matter if it's up in, uh, in Hoboken, New Jersey, or uh, you have a complaint about and you're living down here, or you're staying down here. If you want to file that complaint against an officer up in Hoboken, New Jersey, you can come into the Burlington County Prosecutor Office, Burlington Township uh, Police Department, and you can file that complaint. That complaint will then be sent up to the appropriate county where it will then be handled through them. But I just want to make sure that, we, that everybody's aware that we handle these, we accept them 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We are available to accept these complaints. We will, once we get the complaint, we review the complaint. We try and get some more information, which usually involves reaching out to the person who filed the complaint. Now, I do have to tell you that it becomes difficult at times when, it, when we have an anonymous complaint, because usually we can't locate the person or there's not enough information in those complaint in order to conduct a completely thorough examination or a thorough investigation. We do our best. We, we try and leave no stone unturned, but sometimes there's not enough information in those, uh, in those complaints. There's no dates of when the incident occurred. There's no uh, specific as to who the officer was. Those t that type of information, we never end up uh, really being able to uh, sustain because we, we don't have the information to begin with from anonymous complaints. But the process, uh, which Lieutenant Sullivan said, it goes through, they receive a complaint, they look at the complaint, if the complaint is criminal, he calls me. And we review that complaint immediately for any criminality, and then we take the next steps possible. If we make a determination that it's not criminal, that it's nothing that uh, is criminal, then we allow or we proceed with the normal process, which is we send it back down to the township in order to conduct their investigation. If somebody goes through that process, there is a result from that process and a, uh, and a case is either sustained, not sustained, exonerated. Uh, at, at a certain point, if that person is not satisfied, they can contact our office. And at our office, we will then contact Burlington Township, have that entire file sent up to us, and then we conduct almost an appeal review of that case. And we review it a second time. If there's an issue further after that, anybody is perfectly welcome to go to the attorney general's office to go through their process and see if they, uh, and I've had to send files from townships or from us up to the attorney general's office for them to review that file. There's a, a several tiered system in order to make sure that nobody is skirting the issues. We wanna be as transparent as possible within the attorney general guidelines and within the policy and procedures, as transparent as possible that we are not trying to hide anything. We are not trying to cover anything up. We, we, we get the complaint that we're handed and we conduct as thorough investigation as we can. We attempt to reach out to people. There's a lot of times where we don't get calls back from people. Um, we, don't, we, don't, we don't receive information. We don't get any information and any more or additional information and it makes it harder for us to conduct those investigations. However, we do our best to try and find that and find out that. If some, someone just asked, is, is there a new guideline uh, of um, reporting on police yeah. discipline? And I wanted, I, I, did, I, I hadn't did heard that. Back to that. I, I, I have to apologize because what I said earlier was, was not as, as direct and, and clear as I thought it was going to be. Uh, and that is that, uh, yeah, that's the, um, so 
the information that goes out to the complainant when the investigation is complete is, is what we refer to as either an exonerated letter, letter a not sustained letter, a, um, a sustained letter, or a, um, uh, an unfounded letter. So the individual complainant himself or herself will receive that letter. And in that letter, it says, it will say, you know, uh, internal affairs case number 2020-1. Your complaint about officer or your complaint about Lieutenant Sullivan was investigated. This was the outcome of our investigation. And there is some, uh, there is a, uh, there is, uh, how do I say, maybe an explanatory sentence or two that, that, that explains why that result would, would came, we came to that result or not. Um, in that letter, and I would have to defer to Brian on this because to this, to this point, we have not had to disclose the names of folks who have received major discipline, but to date, in that letter, it would just say it was sustained, <coughs> it was a violation, the officer will be addressed administratively. And that would be close of letter, and it goes out. Uh, a couple of the attendees are correct in pointing out that under the new attorney general uh, process, um, that there is a requirement moving forward that officers that receive what's considered major discipline, which is uh, generally considered a, a suspension of five days or more on an annual basis, the department has to release that information to the public. Do, did I state that accurately, Brian? Did that? I believe, I, I believe that's, that, that, that is uh, the proper way of stating it. I'm not sure, though, uh, it hasn't been completely clear on how that information is going to get to the public. Um, I believe that it's supposed to be sent to the Attorney General's office and the Attorney General's office is going to release that to the public. But I know there's been litigation as to that issue. And I, I believe that there was, a, it went to the appellate court, um, which um, I think had hearings on it in September and a decision came down uh, in which they agreed with the Attorney General's office. And now I believe that has been appealed again up to the New Jersey Supreme Court to determine how, how what the process is of this. Um, and I think the end result, I, I anticipate the end result being that any major discipline suspension is going to have to be uh, released publicly along with the names, much like um, state police have done for a number of years, I believe, uh, under a consent decree. From but but, but for but for clarity, uh, my understanding is that will still not be in that letter that that lieutenant just referenced. That it's not going to be a part of that letter coming yeah. back to this one individual situation. It's going to be something that the attorney general might release. You know, in, in this department, these three guys have been suspended for twenty days or, or whatever. But yeah. it's not going to be on this one specific situation that addresses your case. So. Don't, no. don't look for that. I, I agree with you. I agree with you. And, and there's, a, there's a bit of a discrepancy there that it's going to be released publicly. However, the person who doesn't receive the letter is, uh, is not going to know exactly, exactly what happened. So there is a discrepancy, and that probably still has to be worked out at, with the Attorney General's office. But, um, but it is going to be released as of now. And uh, that, uh, AG, um, that AG guideline did come out. And after the Supreme Court, I believe, either hears it or chooses not to hear it, um, that process will be started. So uh, I, I don't think that's going to be an issue moving forward. Uh, it's in the effort of uh, the Attorney General is uh, doing this in an effort to be more transparent, uh, as a lot of other states are, uh, considering, con considering uh, the state of our country right now, it is very good for us to be more transparent with issues. Absolutely. So um, another question came up um, in terms of, we're gonna go into traffic stops again. Is it okay for someone who's being stopped to ask for a supervisor um, to come to the area when they've been stopped? <laughs> um, they can ask. <laughs> I, so I, I, what I would say, <laughs> certainly can ask. Mm -hmm. um, there is, we, um, what I would say is there's no obligation for that to necessarily happen. And that may very well be because, again, like I mentioned earlier, at least in Berlin Township, we have at least one supervisor on at all times. But 
more often than not, it is just one supervisor on at all times. And that supervisor might be tied up with other matters that require their attention. And not okay. that the person on the car stops uh, uh, wanting that supervisor to come out there is not important, but maybe they just can't get there. Um, okay. It's, I think the better course of action would be to uh, make the complaint at, after the fact. I think if somebody has a concern about it, that they, whether they want to call in the complaint, whether they want to go on our website and submit the complaint uh, on, on our internal affairs, like complaint portal, whether they want to come in in person, whether they want to send it in by way of, of, of email uh, to, to my office directly, because I'm, I'm listed on the website. I think that's the, the better route of going about that. Uh, again, it's just logistically that that supervisor may not be able to get there. And then mm -hmm. like if we're at a crossroads, then, then what do we do? Right. I, I don't, right. Know, that makes right. sense. Um, and, and some more myth busters. Uh, that was one of the myths that was out there that I can ask for a, a supervisor before I have to interact with the officer. That's not correct. Uh, another myth is that if I'm a female uh, and a police officer asks me to get out the car, uh, that another a female officer has to come and, and handle me. That, that also is not um, correct. So I just want to make sure that all the myths out there are getting um, busted because what's happening is people are living according to myths and finding themselves in big trouble. Right. I would also like to, to, to just uh, uh, talk to Lieutenant Sullivan and, and, and also point out that a, a lot of officers now, and the majority in the county of uh, municipalities have body-worn cameras. And are also, when this happens, they are, are a lot of these interactions are being recorded. So I, when we went back before and we were talking about people filming stuff, we, we at the prosecutor's office usually collect that information when there's an issue. When somebody has a files a complaint, we will collect the body worn cameras, the um, the, the dispatch, uh, any type of any any communication to a central, any other type of information to come to a determination of how the interaction happened, how how it, how the event began, what happened during the interaction, and how it was completed. So I just want people to be aware. In a lot of these occasions, um, there are body worn cameras or there are recordings of this of these stops. So when an officer asks you, um, where are you going? Are you required to respond? Counselor? Um, okay, so this, is, this, this goes back to, our, I'm, let's, let's talk about car stop. No, let, let me just say this. <laughs> if it is a walking down the street and, and a police officer approaches you, um, there's three levels. Uh, one is field inquiry. Um, basically, uh, he's just asking you some questions. In a field inquiry, it's, it's voluntary for you to stand there, for you to answer questions. Uh, that's voluntary uh, because at this point, he does not have any probable cause to detain you. However, uh, if that goes to a place where he has, uh, as Lieutenant had mentioned, an articulable suspicion an offense might have occurred or something's wrong, uh, then he has probable cause to detain you. Uh, you're no, not under arrest yet, but you're detained. So it, it's no longer voluntary for you to leave or go. And at that point, um, my understanding is last reading I've done is name and identifiers, things of that nature are not protected uh, information. Um, so that you must give your name, uh, where you're coming from, where you're going uh, is debatable. Uh, Brian, you, you, you might jump in there with me. Uh, from a defense standpoint, I would say not necessarily. However, what happens is, does that raise now the, um, does that raise the, the probable cause? You know, now all of a sudden, if, if it looks like you're hiding something, now he goes to the level of probable cause and he starts to create an investigation and, uh, and it goes a little further. I, I don't I, I don't necessarily know if that alone raises it. Uh, mm -hmm. if you don't respond that way. I mean, usually in these circumstances, it's a variety of factors that go into determining that. So just based on a situation of somebody saying not responding or something like that, I, I, you, you probably are going to be okay with that. But when there's other circumstances and other issues going on and there's other suspicions 
of people being around you, keeping your hands in your pocket and, 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 and uh, different types of movements. There's other things going on that can help add to raising that suspicion. And I think that's usually when you can, when somebody can start to get themselves in trouble with that. Um, and I know a lot of that is subjective uh, at, at times, but um, the officers are out there and they're trying to protect the safety of people and also the safety of themselves. So they do, they do have to look at things sometimes with, uh, with a skeptical eye because that's what they're trained to do, to look for problems at, at times. They're, they're, not, they're, lo they're there to serve and protect. Would you so, agree with Dorian or? Yes, so here, here's, the, here's the problem. The problem is, and, and many of us don't know our rights. So I, I carry this with me everywhere I go. It's the US Constitution. Uh, read it, it's, it's quick. Is, 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 at least for me anyway, it's quick reading. Just get to know it. Now, because here's what I, as a, as a defense attorney, you knowing your rights better allows you to explain to me what happens so that I can protect your rights. I, I know we as, as, as individuals often want to protect our own rights in the situation. And very often it, it, it gets you messed up. So my thing is know your rights so that you can say to me, well, he, 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 he approached me and asked me where, what, uh, what my name was. I didn't do anything. I didn't answer. I wasn't under arrest. I wasn't under detention. I just didn't want to answer. Well, you're allowed to do that and you're allowed to leave. Uh, but if you did something and, and, and come on, let's, let's go practical. If they can come up with an articulable reason that they feel like you're being suspicious. And as, as uh, Prosecutor Falk said, they can't use you not answering specifically as their probable cause. But if you're, if you're acting furtive or, or, or suspicious or, or, or fidgety or something else, uh, and, and certainly they can say that, then that raises the, uh, the heightened uh, alert level to probable cause and now there are additional responsibilities that you have um, now. So, so my professor said, tell them uh, why prolong the, the encounter and, and get you to that level when all you had to do was give them your name and, and keep on moving. I think also from, from the officer standpoint and um, uh, you, you know, we, we train our officers and, and we supervise them and we provide them a very, a very solid uh, policy foundation um, to know again what the legal thresholds are. I think it's it's and and there has there, there I, I do recognize that the community kind of walks into that uh, interaction um, having to trust that the police are playing by the rules, and I recognize that that's asking for a lot. It's asking for a lot of, of faith and trust in the police that that they're playing by the rules, um, and. What, what I would say is that, um, you know, we, speaking for our department and the caliber of officers we have, that we, we I, and again, I, I've seen it several times, like our officers recognize, like, look, th this is as far as this thing can go. The person does not want to give information, and I have no legal basis for pressing it any further. And therefore, um, we're going to part ways. Um, our, you know, we, we train our officers to know when, again, have you met the threshold or have you not? And if you have not met the threshold, then we've got to part ways. And additionally, I think it's problematic that um, there's a difference between certainly someone can assert their rights and, and choose not to respond. And that is, if, that, if, if someone wants to remain silent, um, uh, depending upon the circumstances, that's certainly within their prerogative. But if the officer already does have the legal basis to detain you. Maybe it is the bolo um, that be on the lookout for somebody. And if you meet a description of somebody who maybe committed a burglary three streets over, and you choose to assert your rights with it, which is certainly within your 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 um uh, you, within your prerogative to do, the officer can't at that moment just let you go. You are still the suspect in the burglary. So now we we may have to detain this longer and prolong this further. Versus if you do choose, you know. It wasn't me. I came from that way, or you know, some other type of explanation that might bring the incident to a close right then and there. Again, I recognize, however, that 
it's there's we're asking the to community to place a lot of trust in us and place a lot of faith in us that we are going to operate by the rules um and, and, and you know at least in, in our department and in the, in the immediate surrounding departments that we work with uh and that we interact with that that's you know by and large officers know where the thresholds are right and that and and part of our administrative review is when we go back and we review body cameras, which we review body camera mm -hmm. footage every single week, reviewing car cameras footage every single week, going over those stop logs, uh, you know, checking the officer's reports. If an arrest is made, every arrest report gets reviewed by a supervisor. Believe you me, if the supervisor spots a, a problematic arrest, like, ooh, there wasn't probable cause for this to occur, that's going to get addressed in the Burlington Township Police Department. If we see something on camera where the officer uh, wasn't uh, respecting and uh, uh, someone's constitutional rights or maybe was taking things further than they were lawfully justified taking it, I can tell you in the Burlington Township Police Department that is going to get addressed. Um, you know, aside from citizen complaints that occur, we internally generate complaints when we, when we, when we believe our, our members commit um, violations. We're very fortunate that happens very few and far between uh, in this agency. We, again, we believe we have very good officers. But we, if we see something, we we address it. We address it. And, and Lieutenant, you also, when you said you do, uh, you conduct those body worn camera random reviews each week, just to to see, make sure everything's going on okay. Is that correct? Yeah. Every 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 supervisor is responsible for doing a certain number of, of random body camera uh, and or car camera reviews every, every single week, and it's a documented review, and it goes up. If there's if we spot something that's problematic, again, we we address it. You know. Um, Again, even, same thing with the reports. You know, officers have to submit reports when arrests are made. They have to submit reports when, uh, uh, you know, uh, certain things occur. And all those reports, they get reviewed by supervision, right? And that's, that's again, that's our kind of our, our opportunity to capture mistakes and, and address them. So earlier, um, Dorian, you said that, you know, when people are stopped, they do have the right to ask um, why they're being stopped and, you see no reason you haven't seen it where an officer uh, may not necessarily answer the question unless there's some other something else out there um, in the legal realm. But a question now is um, as far as your rights to allowing your car to be searched, when must a driver allow their car to be searched? So um, a car and, and it's, it's getting... <laughs> I would call it first, but uh, there was there was a time where they had to have what we call exigent circumstances. However, at this point now, um, the law says that if the officer uh, has probable cause that there's something in the vehicle, um, they well certainly if they arrest you, they're allowed then uh, to to search the car. Uh, if it's not an arrest situation, they they have to ask you, and if you say yes, you're allowed to search my car, then they're, you know, they'll have you sign a little document and, you, and they'll search it. If you say no, then they'll say, okay, fine. Uh, we're going to hold the car until we get a, a search warrant from a judge. Um, and then very often, because that takes some time, they're going to impound that car uh, and hold on to it till the search warrant comes in. Uh, and then when the warrant comes from a judge or if the warrant comes from a judge, then they're allowed to go in there and search it. Okay. Thank you. So um, the next question um, we want to get into deals with the use of force, and it has a few parts. So Lieutenant Sullivan, when are officers authorized to use force? And then what happens after force is used? And how does the department determine if force was appropriate or not? And what type of force training do the officers undergo each year? Okay, so I'll take the last first and then I'll go back to the top. <laughs> okay. So the training aspect, it's, 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 it's um, the easiest one to answer is that we, when, when we talk about use of force training, so there's, there's the legal and policy aspect of use of force, which we train um, uh, uh, actually three times a year. Uh, there's one in-person session and then there's two additional online sessions. Uh, additionally, we as a department conduct uh, kind of like uh, 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 scenario-based uh, training on an additional day. And then when we talk about the uh, 
aspect of firearms. There's four firearms dates every year. There's, a, there's additional days training for, for taser training. Um, and then additionally, we have training on baton and OC uh, spray uh, as far as like the mechanics of using those. But if you're talking about like the legal uh, aspect of use of force, occurs at least three times a year in the Burlington Township Police Department. Um, so talking about force, there's four generally recognized levels of reportable force in New Jersey. The, the lowest level being physical force. Uh, and that's where you would think about wrestling and, and hand strikes and, and kicks and knee strikes and tackling to the ground and arm bars and wrist locks, uh, kind of like hand-to-hand -hand, uh, 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 techniques. Then elevate it to mechanical force, and in this, in, at least in the Verona Township Police Department, that's where we're talking about our expandable batons, and we're talking about our OC spray. It also includes canine deployment, for Verona Township does not have a canine, so it's not something that we uh, are responsible for. Take it to the next step up, and we've got enhanced mechanical force, which uh, includes uh, a handful of things, but in the Verona Township Police Department, the only enhanced mechanical force option we have is tasers. Um, and then last but not least is the highest level of force, which is deadly force. And that is any force. And there's a reason I say any force. I'll come back to it in a moment. It's any force that's used with the purpose of causing or which creates a substantial risk of causing death or serious bodily injury. Typically, we think of that in the, the form of firearms, but that could also be in the form of a baton strike to someone's head. It could be in the form of uh, any other application of force that creates the risk of death or serious bodily injury. Um, so having those as our levels, there's different authorizations for each level. When we talk about the physical and mechanical force, again, the hand-to-hand -hand techniques, as well as baton and OC spray, author, off, me, officers are authorized to use force at that level when they reasonably believe it's immediately necessary to overcome some type of resistance to protect the officer or a third party uh, from uh, injury or, or to protect uh, property or otherwise accomplish what we call a lawful objective. And that could be some taking somebody into protective custody because they're going through a mental uh, uh, health issue or maybe they're severely intoxicated and we have to take them into custody and, and, and take them over to the hospital or something along those lines. Uh, so that's the level of authorization for those. Enhanced mechanical force gets a little bit more complicated. When we talk about tasing folks, we're typically talking about to prevent uh, death or serious bodily injury, uh, to apprehend somebody who maybe just caused death or serious bodily injury somewhere else. Um, when someone's maybe armed with a deadly weapon and, uh, or when we attempt to arrest somebody and they resist that arrest with force, and that force creates a risk of injury to the officer or somebody else. So that would be the qualifications for the taser. And then the last one, and I think it's the most important one for, for obvious reasons, is the deadly force authorization, which in the state of New Jersey, it's not, it's not a standard as, as the, the world according to the Burlington Township Police Department. I think this is where New Jersey has uh, the benefit of having a very strong state level attorney general's office that the, the standard in New Jersey is established at that level. And that is reasonably necessary, excuse me, reasonably believes it's immediately necessary to protect an imminent danger of death or serious bodily injury. So there's some key language in there, like there needs the, the immediacy of it, the imminent threat, and that it has to be a threat of death or serious bodily injury. Um, though, that's the standard for authorization. We talk about the appropriateness of it, and I think it's important to, to recognize, at least in the Burlington Township Police Department, that uh, use of force application go, undergoes a multi-tier review. So uh, first, any officer that applies any level of force, uh, any one of those aforementioned levels of force has to document that force, has to document that force by way of a use of force report that now goes into a statewide portal as of a couple of months ago. Um, we in Burlington Township conduct a frontline review, so the shift supervisor working that day will immediately start reviewing that use of force, and then it will come to me for internal affairs for uh, uh, an administrative level review, and then ultimately it will go to our director's office for the final sign-off from his perspective, and throughout that process, we assess the force for whether it was appropriate and whether it complied with uh, our policies. 
Yeah, and, and if you think about uh, what's the appropriateness standard, um, it's, it's what's objectively reasonable, right? Uh, when considering what circumstances and facts the officers were, were aware of at the time, was their particular application of force objectively reasonable? Um, some things that we consider are, what was the immediacy of the threat that the officers faced? What was the severity of the threat that the officers faced? Was the person attempting to resist arrest or otherwise you know, flee from the scene versus were they being you know, uh, perfectly compliant? So those are, I know I kind of gave everybody a mouthful right there, but those are kind of the standards that we look at. And again, that is a stat, it's a set at a state level. Um, uh, I think it's worth noting as well that uh, when we talk about uh, taser deployments, taser deployments all go to the prosecutor's office for review. When we talk about any use of force that results in serious bodily injury or injury to any extent from firearms, goes to the prosecutor's office. And then if there's any force that results in death or any, any type of in-custody death in the state of New Jersey, that goes to the attorney general's office. Now, I, I think maybe Brian can touch a little bit more about those because those are at levels beyond what, what I, I participate in. Um, but I think it's important to note that, again, in the state of New Jersey, if there's serious bodily injury involved, if there's a death involved, if there's a firearms discharge involved, uh, it's not the Brown and Township Police Department looking at it. It's eyes outside of the Brown and Township Department, uh, Police Department looking at it to determine whether or not it's appropriate. When, and I'll expand on that. When, when we get into the, um, the realm of uh, CED or conductive energy, energy, energy devices, tasers, for example, that automatically comes up to, level, uh, to our level at the county area. Uh, and we conduct a review of that. And that's the enhanced mechanical level. Then when it gets up to deadly force or, um, or if there's an officer involved shooting or uh, an attempt to use deadly force, something along those lines, the county prosecutor's office is the, uh, the one office that uh, specifically gets involved in that. And when there is a, uh, a discharge of a weapon, the county prosecutor's office automatically comes in and we get called out immediately and uh, we have officers that go directly to that scene and lock down that scene and then we start conducting our investigation immediately um, and we move on from there. If somebody actually, uh, if there's a use of deadly force and somebody actually dies at the scene, uh, at that point we get initially called, however that call will go next directly up to the Attorney General's office and they have an officer involved shooting or a shooting response team that automatically comes out and they conduct the investigation at that point. A lot of this is done because we don't want any conflicts of interest coming in. If, if an officer uses his gun and, and discharges it, uh, we don't necessarily want one of that, that, somebody from that department conducting that investigation. We want to take any type of conflict out of it and we want the county, office, uh, the county prosecutor's office to look at that independently. And if there's actual deadly force use, well then at that point, we want the attorney general's office to come in and look at it so that there's no additional conflict of interest. Um, we're very concerned about uh, the process to make sure that there is trust within the process for these. Uh, we don't want there to there look anything to look like there's covers up in these processes. But we're trying um, to be transparent as possible. Question, uh, just, just to jump in, because I, I hear a lot of, you know, scuttlebutt. Uh, around the, the, the community. One couple questions. Uh, so why doesn't, or what's the difference between tasing and, and shooting? Say, say if um, officer is wrestling with a guy and the, the, the guy gets his, his taser and they start in a chase and the guy shoots the taser at the officer and another officer has a taser, why not tase him instead of shoot him? Or if a police officer is being approached by someone with a knife, uh, why not shoot him in the leg? Or, or, or I've heard all sorts of things like that. Um, you know, why not use these other things instead of using the deadly force? I, I know, hate to put you on the spot, but if you could address some of the, the myths, that I think that's what we really need to do. I mean, I, I think I can tackle some of the practicalities and maybe Brian wants to tackle some, maybe some of the legalities, if you will. Sure. Um, so, I, um, 
the we tr with the way we train our officers, uh, and again, the the standard that's trained when we talk about deadly force, because obviously deadly force is the most impactful and that and it's it's, it's the most uh, important application of force. Um, that uh, again, we we train them to know that the standard is uh, uh, it's it's immediately necessary to address an imminent threat of death or serious bodily injury. Um, there, uh, that, that's the standard. And that's the standard by which I, I think, you know, the, the incident's gonna be, that's a lens through which the incident's gonna be reviewed. From a training perspective, we also teach them that um, if there's ways that they can de-escalate the situation or prevent the situation from ever getting to that level, that is what they are trained to attempt, right? If we can, through verbal commands, or if we can through, if we don't have to ramp the situation up, we don't want to ramp the situation up, right? Uh, if we can avoid it, that, that is what we train. And I can tell you, uh, again, just for our department, I, I think our officers have done a, a tremendous job of that. I was just real quickly, as we're going, I was just going back through so the last five year stats on our use of force. And if we look at, we're averaging, uh, I think 16, and 16.6 uh, uses of use of force incidents per year. 94% of those use of force incidents in Burlington Township involve only hand-to-hand uh, uh, -hand techniques, wrestling, punches, kicks, strikes. And then uh, there's a couple of baton deployments and a couple of taser um, uh, deployments uh, 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 kind of like sprinkled in there as well. I think that at least for our department, that that demonstrates kind of is, is exemplary of what is what we train our officers is to number one use the least amount of force, only do it when it's necessary, and then discontinue force when it's no longer needed. And if we can never, if we don't ever have to use force through de-escalation techniques, through what our officers are trained through CIT as far as uh, uh, addressing mental uh, uh, mental health issues, uh, somebody who's maybe going through an acute issue. Uh, even somebody who may potentially be under the uh, influence of some type of substance, is if we can, uh, by way of tactic or by way of verbalization, de-escalate the situation, that is what we'll attempt. There are, however, uh, some things when we talk about deadly force from a practical scenario. Officers are trained from a firearm perspective. They're trained to aim at and fire at center mass and they're trained to do so until the threat no longer exists. Um, I know folks um, uh, that there, there are, there's questions out there, why not shoot somebody in the leg or why not shoot somebody in, in, in an arm? That's problematic because the smaller target you shoot, you aim at, the more likelihood of risk of that bullet going where you don't want it to go, somebody standing behind 300 yards down the road, um, and additionally, you have a decreased likelihood of stopping the threat that way as well. Um, in very highly dynamic situations, and um, uh, you, you know, there's 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 plenty of video up there out there of, of situations that uh, you know lots of people have opinions on on both sides of it. Um, in highly dynamic situations, you know, aim center mass so that you have the greater likelihood of hitting the target you intend to hit versus somebody unintentionally, we call it threat backstop and beyond. And you'll have the greater likelihood of stopping the threat that way. It's, it's, it's terribly problematic you know, for officers to attempt to hit a moving uh, target when that target is that person's arm 20 yards away. That's a, that I, if you think about the physiological limitations of human beings, that is a tremendously tall ask. That is a tremendously difficult Sure. So, so not to make light of it, but uh, the shooting the gun out of someone's hand that we see in the westerns is just not practical. That's that's not practical. And then we, and even when we think about, you know, you talk about taser situations and knives get involved and, and things that it's. Uh, I mean, a lot of that stuff is very fact sensitive. You know, is somebody standing thirty feet away, just holding the knife down, and they're not moving at all, or is somebody twenty four feet away? but running full charge at the officer with the knife elevated. Um, tasers, uh, you know, that, that's a very different dynamic there. In one instance, maybe we can talk to the person. In the second instance, that's a very volatile situation that right here, right now, something needs to be done to stop this. 
Um, and then even with tasers, tasers, I, I, I apologize, I don't know the exact statistics, but there's some, there's some studies out there that, you know, the usefulness of, of tasers of, of, you know, 60 some percent, that it, it, it does what you intend it to do. We're fortunate in Burlington Township that our taser deployments did what we intended them to do, and we were able to subdue the situation, take that person into custody. But we actually, in just one of our trainings, that our training department was rolled out with all of our officers over the last few weeks is we watched a video coming out of Chicago that happened not too long ago. Uh, and this is uh, Chicago's um, the acronym is COPA. I, don't, I can't remember what it stands for. Uh, their, 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 their oversight authority has all this information out online. And that was a situation where they tased the gentleman with, with, with a knife and he was still able, he tased, went down, was able to still get back up and still come charging at the at the one female officer until unfortunately deadly force had to be applied. You know, there, I, I think there, there's just some physiological limitations that, you know, it's just, there's only but so much. But as a premise, as a premise, the attempt to de-escalate, the attempt to avoid the use force. But if, if things get to the point where the force has to be used, that's where they're trained. Center mass, stop, stop, stop the threat. And certainly doesn't doesn't make any any loss of life life any less tragic. It, it's certainly right. tragic, uh, but that that's those are the standards, and, and that's what we train. And knock on wood, and, and 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 to the credit of our officers, at least here in Burlington Township, we like ninety four percent is is nothing more than hand to hand technique. That that's that's we would rather have it be none, but we we're, we're happy that it's that versus elevated levels of force. I'd like, I'd like just to jump in real fast that. Um, in, I'm thinking, oh, geez, that's, that's my uh, fire alarm in my house, going, smoke alarm in my house going off. I apologize. <laughs> he's off. Wait. He's on mute. You're muted, Brian. Oh, okay. I, um, I'll say, you know, so. I happen to see a couple more kind of like, Follow-up questions to this topic there before maybe Brian can come back is that, yeah, I mean, that's, so we've all seen video out there and there's, you know, these, these situations, these, these highly dynamic situations, these controversial situations, you know, very, very fact sensitive. And in one instance, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, it, it's, it, you could, you could view and say, you know, these officers were wrong. That should not have happened. And then another instance, some, you know, some people, uh, you, you know, some, some folks might say, hey, we, we don't think that this should have happened. But I think also that there's physiological limitations. Aside from training, aside from policy, aside from, you know, uh, all that stuff, aside, there's, there's some physiological limitations. And that's, you know, we just, uh, you know, we, we train our officers to, to avoid it as best as possible. You know, the incident that happened in Philadelphia last week. Uh, mm. I, I'm going to tell you as an officer, that, that was a highly dynamic, highly volatile situation. Right. I, I don't think it's my place to place assessment on whether it was lawful or not, but I, I, I think it was a highly dynamic situation. And I think um, the officers were, 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 were confronted with, 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 with a danger uh, that, that, you know, uh, that, that they had to address, and, and that's the way they chose to address it. And I, it, you know, it's, it's just, it's, it's certainly tragic, but it's, the, the, you know, it, the physiological limitations, I think, are very important to be mindful of, of as well. Lieutenant, while we're talking about what happened in Philadelphia last week, um, there, there are questions in the chat about mental health and how the police are trained to handle, how to handle mental health uh, patients. Um, are the, the police trained um, when it comes to... Um, how to counsel and, and getting trauma experience on the job. How, how are you guys being trained to cope with, with this? And we all know mental health is a rising issue um, that's becoming more and more prominent, especially now. So can you speak to that? So it, uh, I take that as kind of a two-part question. I think one is yes. um, how, how are we dealing with uh, engaging with folks in the community uh, uh, when, the, when they're dealing with mental health issues? And I yes. think the second part is also internally uh, within our own ranks, how are we uh, are, how are we looking at our own mental health and our own our, our yes. own well being? Mm -hmm. So um, the the dealing with folks in the community with mental health issues is, is, is as as most um, uh, uh, people on the panel know, if, if not everybody, is that you know Brown Township is is one of the agencies that is very much on the forefront of, of uh, crisis intervention training. 
um, and we have been for, for a very long time, many, many years, um, that every one of our officers is trained under the CIT um, paradigm. And uh, I wish Officer Broadway were here to, to, to speak a little bit more about that because that is one of his, uh, his passions and he, I think does an excellent job on the county level as the county coordinator uh, on that. But um, we, and, and as he likes to say, is we're not training officers to be social workers or psychiatrists or psychologists. We're, we're, we, are, we train officers to recognize indications of somebody who may be going through a mental health uh, uh, crisis and uh, uh, maybe uh, trying a few techniques that would, again, de-escalate the situation. Um, and it's um, uh, a lot of the techniques that they go through, uh, not only just identifying someone who's going through some mental health issues, understanding that, recognizing it, understanding it, and, and trying to uh, and try to bring resolution to the situation that, that takes that into consideration um, is also stuff that we can apply to even those who don't have, have, have mental health issues. It's, it's it, you know, the art of being able to, to, to speak with somebody, connect with somebody, so mm -hmm. that, again, force doesn't have to be used. So every one of our officers goes through that 40-hour training. Um, and when we talk about internally is... Um, yeah. Additionally, we have um, an it's a statewide program. Again, there's there's a resiliency program, and we have uh, three officers in our agency that have been trained uh, in, in the uh, how to be resilience officers for our agency, and just kind of checking in on one another. And it's an obligation of supervision as well as kind of like taking the temperature of our people, especially after you know uh, critical situations, critical incidents, debriefing and um, identifying whether or not somebody is is is, is responding poorly because of that critical incident and then even generally from an officer wellness perspective just our early our early intervention system is being mindful of our folks and if we see you know Jim Sullivan starting to present in a different way and it looks like you know he's not acting his, his normal way is let's let's sit down and have a conversation about that mm -hmm. and then refer to an employee assistance program if necessary so another question that came up in the in the chat um, as we begin to wrap up um, want to talk a little bit about reasonable suspicion um, that's basically a, a judgment call. And DWB, which is nationally known as driving while black profiling, how does the, the police department deal with that? So I think multi-part answer. The first part is we have no tolerance for bias space policing. It's an absolute, and, it, it, and it's not just policy, it's culture. We recognize that culture will eat policy for breakfast every day of the week, twice on Sunday. But we don't just have it on paper. We mean it. We, re we embed it. We indoctrinate our people with it. We, we reinforce it time and time again through just agency culture. You know, what's, what's the identity of our organization so that everybody recognizes that that's not acceptable professional policing. Um, you know, we, we like to say there's really like our, our, four, our four ingredient recipe to success, at least for us, Burlington Township, recruit the best that we can, train them as well as we possibly can, give them policies to which they can refer when, when decisions are questionable. How do I decide what to do here? And last but not least is supervision. And last is probably should have came first, which is supervision, that we invest in our supervisory staff so that they can not only supervise our officers, but they mentor them, they guide them, they set the example of how we expect our officers to perform and conduct themselves. Again, there, there's nothing that compels the Burlington Township Police Department to do weekly body camera and patrol vehicle camera reviews. Nothing anywhere makes us do that other than we recognize it as an, an important way of making sure our people are performing the way that we want them to perform. And if we see indications of bias-based policing through any of our administrative reviews, we, we, we address it. Um, and, you know, go back to a prior answer, which we teach our, our officers what the threshold is. If you don't have the threshold, you're not going to take the next step. If you haven't satisfied the requirements of this, you're not going to take the next step. Um, and then, again, just having an, a, a, a culture that recognizes that uh, you know, even going back to what we've recently done in our uh, in-service training, bringing some folks in uh, to talk about, you know, race-based relations, race trauma, interacting with uh, community, uh, the minority community, that 
recognizing it and exposing our, our folks to, to, you know, the views and perspectives of our community so that there's, have that mutual respect, right? Have that mutual recognition and mutual respect of, of treating one another, uh, you know, the, the way that everybody deserves to be treated, if you will. Okay. One final question um, before we wrap up. Um, if someone is pulled over in a poorly lit street, do they have the right to request that they move to better lighting and move a few, few yards up so that the lighting is better, that they feel safer? Do they have the right to ask that? So, I mean, from the officer, from the officer perspective is, is we, um, first and foremost, our officers want to stop in better lit areas versus low lit areas. So we're going to want to get to better light just as much as maybe you want to get to better light as well. Um, and additionally, like, you know, we turn the lights on and, and, and not everyone pulled over that very exact second, right? There's always a little bit of a buffer of, okay, let me find somewhere to pull over. Let me maybe find a better place. And that's, and again, we train our officers, like, if, if you see a violation in a dimly lit area where there's traffic everywhere and it's potentially problematic, and you know a half mile up, you're going to have the Walmart parking lot that you can use to your advantage, wait until you get there to initiate the stop. Because then naturally somebody's going to go in there. I think, and, you know, if somebody wants to kind of, and we've seen it, that if, if somebody wants to kind of pull up a little bit further, maybe find a little bit of a better place to park. I th and again, I think our officers have enough wherewithal to recognize that this is not somebody who's purposely trying to get away from me or is purposely, this is a natural, someone's trying to find someone to park kind of thing. You know, I, I think and, it's- And from a practical standpoint, I would just say, put your flashers on, slow down so that you alert the officer that right I, on. that I see you, that I'm, I'm going to obey you, but you know, I'm pulling over and you, you want to explain that, <laughs> that listen, I, I was in the dark. I was on the back of Oxmead road and, and, there were no lights out there and I was trying to get somewhere lit. Um, but yeah, you, but unfortunately, uh, on a practical note, you can't drive five or six miles looking for, you know, the best spot that that's right. just not going to happen. So as we bring closure to the night, um, I just want to ask each of our panelists just to give, um, just a quick summary in terms of one thing that you hope, um, that the participants got out of tonight from the Know Your Rights session. And I'm not going to call anyone out. I'll let you choose who goes first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dorian. If nobody wants to go. Um, I, I hope you get the fact that, one, uh, we're supposed to work together. Uh, the police and, and the citizens are really supposed to be um, – on the same page for making sure that we have a safe um, uh, society. Um, so it's not supposed to be an us versus them. It's supposed to be all of us working together for a better society. That being said, they named this Know Your Rights. I do strongly suggest that everyone, at least once or twice, read the Constitution so that you know what your rights are. Um, every state, uh, at least well, let's just talk New Jersey. Uh, in 1947, New Jersey adopted the, the, basically the same language as the U.S. Constitution. So if you learn the U.S. Constitution, you will have a, a, a basic understanding of what the rules are uh, in New Jersey. Um, know your rights. Uh, but again, I stress over and over and over again, on the street is not where you fight for your rights. In the courts, or it, in, in, in internal affairs at the, at, the, you know, at the police department or at the prosecutor's office, the AG's office, that's where you fight for your rights. On the street, be cooperative with the police officers. And, and later on, we can go back and address whatever issues um, that, that are addressed. Uh, my thing is, we want everyone to arrive alive, both uh, citizens and police officers. So it, it just creates a, a much safer environment if you just do what you're asked and if they're wrong we'll get them <laughs> i hate to say it that way but you know <laughs> i mean they have the police officers have to answer they've been given this great uh, uh ability or or responsibility to carry guns and to arrest people but with 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 that um privilege if you will comes a lot of responsibility and they have to be held accountable so we can do that but just don't do that on the street on your own trying to say, well, you don't have the right to do this to me. Um, very often, you don't even know what your rights are. Get to know them so that when you do come to me, you can explain what exactly happened and we know how best to address the situation. 
Thank you very much, Dorian. Assistant Prosecutor Falk. I, I'd like to also say I agree with Dorian completely. I know your rights and uh, don't just listen to people uh, on the streets or wherever who are telling you your rights. Learn them for yourself. It, 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 it's extremely important. I also want to, uh, I think something that's really important is that every step of the way when, when you file a complaint or something, uh, you file a complaint with the police department, there is oversight. There is oversight there's supervision every step of the way. And if you don't like the result you got at the municipal level, you can come to the prosecutor's office. You can talk, uh, talk to a, a detective in our unit, you can talk to a detective, you can talk to the, myself, and we will go and conduct a review of the entire case. We will reach out to you and we will conduct our own review. And if you don't like what we have, you can go to the attorney general's office for that process. There are steps, there are firewalls all along the way to protect you and your rights. So that's, that's the one thing I really took away from this is that please don't just think that you go, it's one stop shop and that's it. And everybody's trying to cover for one another. Everybody is out there to do the right thing. Thank you very much. Lieutenant Sullivan, you get the last word for the evening. Ah, uh, uh, wow. Um, so I think in the interest of knowing your rights, I had a bit of a public service announcement, which is it is still the law in the state of New Jersey at this very moment that marijuana is illegal. <laughs> By order of operation, the response to ballot question number one yesterday did not overnight make it legal. There are still things that need to occur for that to happen. Be right. mindful of that if you, if you are one who is tempted to indulge in that. It is, not, it is not the law of the land in New Jersey yet that marijuana is legal. I do suspect our attorney general will be issuing some type of law enforcement guidance in the future. Right. But again, I think let's make like getting recognizing, yes, that ballot question then now transitions it to the, to the legislature as well yes. as you know, the governor's office to put a scheme in place to, to deal with that. So, and and uh, some states that have had it on their ballot and, and ratified have taken up to two years sometimes to get it actually in place where it was uh, operational and legal. So, it's not now, and it probably won't be next week. <laughs> so <laughs> hold on until, and when it becomes legal, I'm sure they're going to get that word out. Everyone will know uh, that it's now for real legal in the state of New Jersey, but right now it is not. So I, th I think that's like my, my one public service announcement for the evening, other than the, just the general, the general umbrella statement, which is, you know, at least in, Bur in Burlington Township, and I, and I don't keep coming back to Burlington Township to speak ill of any other organization. But we, we, we very much believe in the brand that is the Burlington Township Police Department um, and that we, we, we very much believe in the quality and the caliber of our officers. And we believe in, in what it is that they do and, and doing it the right way. And, um, uh, you know, they've proven us right time and time again. And we have every confidence moving forward that they will continue to prove us right. And the reason is because we, we, we establish a very high standard, right? We, we, we recognize that the police is part of the community. The community is the police. That, that's, it's a very symbiotic relationship. It's not adversarial. It's not us versus, versus them. It's a very symbiotic relationship. And we recognize and we take to heart very much our obligation uh, going all the way back 200 years in the days of Sir Robert Peel, right? That we police by consent. It's the community's uh, view of our organization as legitimate that permits us to do our jobs well. And the moment that we betray that, that's when we have, have problems. And we're going to continue to do everything we can to uh, really reinforce what, what trust exists and build upon that and build upon those relationships. You know, we've, you know we, we're proud of our officers. We believe in them. And we're just as proud of it. And we believe in just as much in, in our community. So, um, I, I very much enjoyed the night. I uh, think it was, was, a, was a great event. And I would only say if there's questions pending, if anybody else has something else that they reach out to us, go to the website. I don't know if Eric Pugh can hear me right now. Put it in the chat box, put our website, put the submission form, put it out there so people can see it. So we would like to thank all of our participants for um, spending the past 90 minutes with us, learning about your rights, asking questions, engaging. And we ask that you continue to be involved. Um, an involved community, an informed community makes a great community. So we want to wish you all well. Please stay safe, be well, 
And um, thank you so much for participating. And we hope to see you in our next critical conversations as we continue um, our journey between the school district, our journey with our police department, but more importantly, our journey as a community to move forward. So thank you everyone for coming and be well. Thank you. Thank you.